And um, again, we're, we're going to be talking about some of the life cycle management aspects. Um, I talk, talk more about manure management aspects, and these two studies are more life cycle management projects that we've done at USDA. So the first one, um, we looked at some anabolic steroids. Now, anabolic steroids are not anything new. Um, they've been around since the 1950s when they were first approved for use um, in, in, uh, in beef and, and ruminant diets. And there are natural and synthetic forms of anabolic steroids that are available. And producers uh, use them because they see a pretty good improvement in growth rate, feed efficiency, and carcass leanness. You can see a 10 to 30% increase in growth rate, a 5 to 15% in feed efficiency, and a 5 to 8% in carcass leanness. Um, anabolic steroids are not fed. Um, they're an implant that is placed uh, under this, just under the skin on the back side of the ear. And the ideal placement is, is right between these two um, cartilage areas, right in the center of the ear. And so the, um, the implants are, are the, the steroid is slowly released into the bloodstream over time. When the animal goes to market, the ear is, is discarded. So the implants do not enter the, the food supply chain. So beef from cattle that are implanted with anabolic steroids have like one billionth of a gram more estrogen than beef from cattle that were not implanted. And if you had a 75 gram serving of implanted beef, there would be two nanograms of estrogen. If you had a 75 gram serving of white bread, which was equal to about two slices, you would have 45,000 nanograms of estrogen. So my point here is to demonstrate that anabolic steroids have been used for a long time in the beef industry. They're effective growth promoters and they do not um, harm our food supply. So um, again, I said they're, they're very common in the U.S. beef industry. There was a survey done in 2016, and 70% of U.S. feedlot programs um, in the U.S. They said that they used a two-implant program, and so that's what we studied. Um, in a typical re-implant program, the initial implant would have uh, 16 milligrams of estradiol and 80 milligrams of trembolone acetate, and when the animals are re-implanted, um, they either use the same implant or they can use a, a different one. Um, another common one is to use the 25 milligrams of estradiol and 120 grams of trembolone acetate. There are some aggressive implant programs that are available. In these, um, the initial implant is the same, but the second implant would have 20 milligrams of estradiol and up to 200 milligrams of the trembolone acetate. And of the 16 FDA approved implants for use in feedlot steers, there's only two that contain this combination. So they're out there, they're not the most common thing, um, but, but they are available. And so we had a basic research question and we wondered if the use of an aggressive implant would improve efficiency and nutrient utilization that would lead to decreased emissions from the manure of cattle um, that were given this aggressive implant compared to a moderate implant. So we used uh, two groups of beef steers. We had 60 animals per group and they were implanted using two levels of implants. So again, we had the, the moderate was the, the standard, the typical, and then the aggressive used that um, higher concentration at the re-implant. And this study was replicated three times. We did it in the spring and fall of 2017 and in the spring of 2018. And unfortunately, we had planned to do it in the fall of 2018. Unfortunately, we were not able to collect data from that group of cattle. But um, what we did is we collected urine and feces individually from each animal, and we mixed that to make a, comp a composite sample that had a, a two to one ratio of feces to urine. And um, if you have never had the adventure of collecting urine and fecal samples from steers individually, and I'm guessing most of you haven't, uh, I'm going to um, describe how we collected these samples. So it's a little bit more organized than just following the steers around a pen with a bucket and, and trying to catch some urine. Um, so our herd veterinarian, along with input from our cattle operations crew, came up with a protocol for developing um, urine from steers. And we use a semen collection container with a plastic sleeve on it. So this is the same thing you'd use exactly if you were going to collect semen from, from bulls. And then um, we, we zip tied two brushes on a PVC just to, to make a long handled brush. And then we have uh, just collection vials here. So with one hand, the technician can gently um, brush the sheath of the steer to stimulate the steer to urinate. And with the other hand, they're using the, the holding the collection container to um, collect the urine. So 
so um, animal well-being is is our primary concern and so the cattle are brought in to the shoots are they're under the supervisor supervision of our herd veterinarian right here he was he was there to make sure that the cattle only remained in the chute for two minutes and that was a time that was determined um, so we, we would have sufficient time to collect our samples but we wouldn't have them in the chutes any longer than necessary so again the the urine was collected using the brush in the semen collection container and then it's transferred um, to the, we had 50 mil vials with plastic tops. And while one person was transferring that, another was putting a clean sleeve onto the, um, urine, the urine collection container. And I'd like to point out that, um, that we did have about an 80 to 93% success rate in getting at least 30 mil, milliliters of urine from these steers. Um, the first time we did it, we were about 80% effective. And by the time we were, had collected um, three times, we were about 93% effective. So, um, so we, we felt this was a pretty good method, um, but it should also explain why we had to use like petri dish size uh, analysis because it's, it's hard to get uh, larger volumes than that. But then um, while, while all this was going on, um, we had some lucky individual that got to collect the feces directly from the animal. And so again, the urine and feces were mixed and placed in petri dishes. Um, we used wind tunnels uh, to collect our air samples. And our flux measurements were collected at least six times over a 24 to 27 day period. And that uh, period varied based on which day of the week we were able to get our samples. So we had slightly different instruments than what Beitong used. We had an ANOVA 1412 to analyze our ammonia, our carbon dioxide and our nitrous oxide. And we had some thermal fissure instruments of 450I and a 55I to analyze our hydrogen sulfide and our methane. And then um, we also used a, a GCMS similar to what they Tung used, and we collected uh, sorbent tubes using uh, uh, grab sampling pumps. And we analyzed for volatile organic compounds or VOCs. And we grouped our VOCs into four main um, kind of types of VOCs. So we had total sulfides, which was dimethyl disulfide and dimethyl trisulfide. We had the group that we called our straight chain fatty acids, which was um, acetic acid, propionic acid, butyric acid, a little bit of hexanoic and heptanoic acid and valeric acid. And then we had branch chain fatty acids, which was isobutyric and isovaleric acids. And then finally, we had a, a group that we just um, grouped as our total aromatics like that um, included phenol, formethylphenol, chlorethylphenol, and dolenskatol. So um, getting into some of the data here, um, and, and I set up these slides all the same. So I have the, the spring sampling date, the fall sampling date, and then an overall average. And so when we looked at the carbon dioxide flux from the manure of the beef kettle that were given the moderate or aggressive implants, we saw a significant reduction in um, our carbon dioxide flux in the spring samples, um, but not in the fall. We actually had a significant increase when we used an aggressive implant strategy versus a moderate one in the fall. But overall, we did have a, a reduction in our carbon dioxide flux. And we saw um, with methane, we had, uh, again, a reduction in the spring samples and overall. But in the fall, when we used that aggressive implant strategy, we saw an increase in our methane flux. Now, nitrous oxide was a little bit different. We, uh, we, we saw an increase when we used the aggressive implant strategy in the spring, but our fall samples and our spring 2018 and overall, we actually saw a significant reduction in our nitrous oxide um, flux when we used the aggressive implant strategy. The ammonia, we didn't see a difference initially, but um, then we had an increase again with the fall samples, similar to what we saw with the carbon dioxide. Um, when we used the aggressive implant strategy. And overall, we did have a, a, a significant increase in ammonia flux when we used the aggressive implant strategy. And finally, we looked at hydrogen sulfide, and we had a, a, a very significant increase in hydrogen sulfide when we used the aggressive implant strategies in the spring of 2017. We did see a um, you know, trend and then a significant reduction, but overall, we had an increase in our. Um, hydrogen sulfide flux when we use the aggressive implant strategy. So then looking at some of those VOC compounds that we looked at in the manure and the urine, 
Um, we did not really see much differences. Our total sulfides, our straight chain fatty acids, and our branch chain fatty acids were similar between cattle that were given the moderate and the aggressive implants. But we did see a significant reduction in our total aromatics that included the phenols and those, as Gaetan had indicated, those, those very odorous compounds um, when, we, when we use that aggressive implant strategy. So, so to summarize, when we looked at carbon dioxide, methane, and ammonia flux, they all had a seasonal effect with higher flux um, for the aggressive treatments during the fall sampling and generally lower in the spring. And unfortunately, because we weren't able to get that, that, that fall 2018 sample, we're not really sure if it's, a, if it's a true season effect or if it just happened to be that particular group of cattle. So that's something that we'll want to do a little more examination of. Um, and hydrogen sulfide flux varied over the study, but overall was higher when we used the aggressive implant strategy. And we saw the same thing with ammonia flux. It was also higher when we used the aggressive implant strategy. But nitrous oxide flux was lower when we used the aggressive implant. So then uh, another management tool that we wanted to look at was uh, was the use of ionophores. And so I'm gonna just give you a little background about how they work here. So bacteria in the rumen produce these, uh, these VFAs, includes acetate, butyrate, and propionate. And these are absorbed in the rumen and they're an energy supply for the cattle. So acetate is produced in the greatest um, quantity. However, this process is not the most energy efficient because it produces methane as a byproduct. And methane is emitted directly from the cattle during this, it's through erection, which is essentially burping. And so when you hear politicians talk about farting cows, that's not really the problem. It's actually burping cows. Um, but um, the, the production of propionate is more efficient because it does not produce methane as a byproduct. So, um, so ionophores are antimicrobials. They don't, they don't just wipe out all the bacteria and kill all the bacteria, but they do inhibit the acetate producing uh, bacteria, and that gives a competitive advantage to the propionate producing bacteria. So feeding ionophores to beef cattle improves feed efficiency and results, um, we're hoping, in, in fewer nutrients that are, that are excreted and uh, hoping that that would not impair the environmental quality. So again, our, our research question was really kind of the same. We wanted to know if the use of an ionophore in beef feedlot diets would improve efficiency of nutrient utilization, therefore decrease emissions from the manure of the cattle. So this study, we didn't have to collect samples individually. We had four pens of feedlot cattle that were fed an ionophore. And in this case, we used menensin, which um, is just one of the products that's available. And we had four pens that were fed no ionophore, and there were 30 animals per pen. So our samples were collected six times over a two month period, and we went out into the pens and we collected a minimum of, fr of 10 fresh fecal pads from each feedlot pen. And we defined fresh as a fecal pad that didn't have any crust or any kind of a drying film over it. Now, sometimes we witnessed the animal defecating and that was easy to just go retrieve it. Other times we just looked for something that appeared to be freshly de defecated. So, um, we, we got 20 samples from each pen and then we mixed them with them pen and we subsampled and again we used our little petri dish size uh, containers for analysis. And we used a very similar analysis. We had uh, wind tunnels that were used to collect our ear samples. We used our same instruments, our Nova, our 450i and our 55i. And then again the sorbent tubes were used to collect um, the samples to run on our GCMS and analyze for our volatile organic compounds. Uh, and in, in this case, I don't have a seasonal data, so I'm just going to show you the overall um, differences here or not differences. Um, carbon dioxide, we, we didn't see a significant difference in the flux from the cattle that were fed no ionophore, which is the green bar here, or if they had the ionophore, ionophore in the, the, blue, the blue solid bar. Um, we did see a significant reduction in ammonia flux, and, and I want to point out that this is the flux from the feces of the cattle um, that, that were fed the ionophore and not the ionophore. This does not account for enteric methane, which would be that, that burping. Um, we, didn't, we didn't measure that in this study, but we would expect that to be lower if the ionophore was used. Um, nitrous oxide, there was also no difference between the cattle that were fed the ionophore or not fed the ionophore. 
And we also did not see differences in ammonia or hydrogen sulfide. And when we looked at our volatile organic compounds, the only one that we saw significant differences in was our sulfides, our dimethyl disulfide and our dimethyl trisulfide. We did see a significant reduction when an ionophore was fed compared to no ionophore, but our straight chain fatty acids, branch chain fatty acids, and total aromatics, we did not see a difference. So to summarize this study, um, methane was definitely lower in the feces from cattle fed the ionophore compared to those that were not fed the ionophore, but all the other gases were similar. And the total sulfides were also lower from uh, the feces of cattle that were fed the ionophore, um, but, but no other um, VOCs were affected by the inclusion of the ionophore in the diet. But uh, there's kind of a little caveat here because these results only take into account the concentration of the gases emitted from the feces. They don't um, take into account any urinary contributions or um, any mixing of the urine and feces um, that, that may have occurred. So, so to conclude, um, you know, when we look at these, we say we could say that you know the use of an aggressive anabolic, anabolic, ster anabolic steroid program um, appeared to be, you know, may show some potential as an effective method to lower some greenhouse gases. We didn't see a lot of differences with the ionophore, except for with the methane and those total sulfides. But we do have additional studies underway right now, um, ongoing, where we are measuring um, the, these very same emissions, and we're measuring it actually on the feedlot surface of a pen of cattle. So we're having that, that mixing of the urine and feces. So I'd like to come back to this figure as we're discussing the overall conclusions, because you know, again, when we think about all of, of the areas where air emissions can be impacted, um, you know, some of, these, some of these processes are occurring independent of each other and some of them are correlated. And, and as I indicated, you know, when we did the, the aggressive implant program, we successfully lowered some gases, but for example, hydrogen sulfide was actually increased when we had um, an aggressive implant strategy that was used. And, and Beitong showed this in his studies too, and, and we often see a decrease in one gas that's countered by an increase in another emission. And sometimes these might be a pH dependent reaction, um, sometimes it might be the bacteria that are present, um, there's a lot of factors that play into it, but, um, but it's, it's just something to consider. I mean, the ultimate goal is to lower as many gases as we can, but we do need to, to consider these, these trade-offs that occur. And, and realize that sometimes when we are lowering one gas, we may be creating an opportunistic environment um, for a second gas to be increased. So I would just conclude by saying um, from, from our research at USDA that, that diet, you know, in the form of an ionophore or management um, with use of steroid implants can impact our greenhouse gas emissions and odor emissions from the manure of the feedlot cattle. And it needs to be considered as part of a comprehensive program. And that program also needs to include manure management aspects like Baton talked about, and also some crop, crop management um, strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, because it's not just one silver bullet that's gonna take care of everything. 